Here. Alexander Williams. Here. Sign on the, the agenda is a public participation. You'll be given five minutes. You're asked to come to the polling and sign in. And first, we're going to do Take the time first to thank Shelley Blades for allowing me to come up and speak. I also want to um, thank several council members that I'm familiar with um, for their encouragement. I myself am very concerned about the safety of the people in Cameron. Not only here in Cameron, but throughout the United States. During the Summer of Love, there were 574 protesters all over the cities of the United States, Democratic cities, mind you, predominantly ran. And during these peaceful protests, they burnt down millions and billions of dollars worth of businesses and homes. They pillaged, looted, robbed. I never thought I'd say this, but I think we're pretty much hearing Cameron very close to that happening. And I mean this. So, my concern right now is, first and foremost, let me give you a little quick bi uh, biography of myself. God, family, country, and hard work. That's what matters to me. And we cannot fix broken boys, but we can fix broken boys, but we can't fix and repair broken men. And the men that are broken are the ones right now that are not paying attention. You gentlemen and ladies here, I'm hoping, I'm praying we're all together in the fact that we care about the people here. My proposal to this city council, nothing good happens in the dark. Nothing good happens in the dark. People want to protest, hopefully peacefully. I wish that we would consider 8 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock at night for peaceful protests. Secondly, I think it's in the best interest of public safety. I'm sure this police officer back here, I have not met him or know him, but I'm quite confident he would agree with me. As they protest, they will cross streets, they will impede traffic, they will basically stop other people's liberties and freedoms. My suggestion, I always have answers to everything, and I do have answers to most anything. Um, let's have a designated area. Way back when we had what was called the town crier that would sit in the town square, much like what you have here, and they would be the ones to police and take care of the people of the city and, and comfort the community. And they would also let the people in the community know what's going on. They were very well trusted people. So I myself feel for the benefit of the people in Cameron, so no motorcyclists have to slow down to the point of almost tipping their bicycles, motorcycles over, that they have a place to be other than over highways, littering, and playing loud, vulgar, vile music. I am speaking of one group in particular who are not very happy that want to change the state purple. Good luck with that. <clears throat> and they really are not, they were on my podcast for two hours. And if you watch my podcast on the Bill of Rights Network, you can actually see the physical display of the anger, hatred, and animosity against good people that are family oriented to where parents 
laying down the walls, and the children followed them. I'm sure everyone here knows where I'm going with this because it seems like these parents now of the younger ones are wanting to quote unquote be their friends. They don't want to lay down walls. And we, as good men and women, on this board that you are, I believe you to be, I think it's your, your, your duty to protect society, the community of Cameron. Let's make something happen that might be even noteworthy and pick up on other cities around the country. You don't need to be there at, after eight o'clock at night. And lastly, I'd like to address this situation. Apparently there are a lot of people that question their sexuality. I know being a man, I know what my equipment is, and I'm not going to be vulgar, but I'm going to be scientific. I have a penis and two testicles. We're at five minutes. I have to stop. I have to stop. Really? Can I have two more? You can have my five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. At the Cameron Pool, the management company seems to feel fit to turn a blind eye to boys and young men or men going into the girls' locker room. Supposedly, that's what I've heard. My answer to that one is, ladies that enjoy the pool of Cameron with your little girls in the locker room with you, someone should walk up to them and greet them, and someone should maybe consider tasing that person. And why do I say that? So that man or that woman, so that woman or that girlfriend can call their boyfriends or their husbands and allow the men to go in there and take care of a sexual deviant. Men do not belong. I do not belong. And if I was to strip down right here, it would be considered a decent exposure to everyone here. I'll tell you what, we need to get strong and we need to be strong. It's going to take a little bit of backbone. I don't know who wants to have that strength, who shares it, who wants it. But we've got to make some changes here. We've got to make them quick. Because we're going to have Black Lives Marxists here. We're going to have Antiva anarchists here. And we are going to be paying a price in this little tiny town. I come from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, born and raised, traveled all over the world and around the country. I'm happy to be here. Can't even begin to tell you how much I love this community. And the people I've met, they're good people. We've got to get grips on things that are not right. Pledge of Allegiance, first time I've said that in so many years, I can't even remember when. And we have it out of our schools. We have prayer out of our schools. These are things that we probably should consider bringing back into schools, and I don't have any game I have no dog in a fight. I have no children, but I would want my kids every morning to say a prayer and to pledge of allegiance because patriotism is what's lacking in this, in this country. And I think we can do a big change right here. <clears throat> I thank you for your time. And uh, hopefully if the fathers uh, do the right thing, you won't really have to deal with those kind of people, sir. Because I don't think your men and women on your staff need to deal with people like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And man, thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to address the council? Seeing none, our final agenda is a consent agenda.
And you're here by appointing Nancy Leach to the Cameron Housing Authority. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All in favor, all abstention. services uh, the wastewater treatment plant as you know they do all of our day-to-day -day operation of our treatment facility uh, do a very good job at it uh, this uh, this amendment to the agreement will again will extend the contract will extend the contract and also set the price for the following year uh, the price for operation for the upcoming year will be four hundred ninety two thousand three hundred seventy two dollars uh, that's about a nine and a half in percent increase from the previous year and I believe probably the majority the bulk of that comes uh, from chemicals and an increased cost of materials. Uh, Alliance does a very good job for us. Uh, we don't have any issues with it. And also included in that money is about is thirty four thousand nine hundred dollars that's used for various maintenance items. And of course, as I you know in the past, any of that money is not spent. They bring that money. We get that money back to the city. So and they and they, and they do they do a good job of of, uh, of being good stewards of the city's money. So uh, I have no issues with, uh, with with the service they provide for us. So. It would be staff recommendation to approve this ordinance. Will this pose an increase in what we're charging the public? Um, we will be talking about sewer rate increases. Um, we have several things, have several other factors that, that are that are that will play into that. Um, this is a small portion of it. If this was all we were dealing with, we we could probably get by. Um, but the fact that we have the upgrades to the plant. Um, and, a few other, and then uh, also in our sewer budget is the collection side. So, you know, we're seeing the increase of material on our side as well. So um, with all those things coming, yeah, we're, we're going to have to do some type of an increase. But it, it wouldn't be directly because of the increase in this, this contract price. And, sense. Mayor, we will bring that back to you on Monday, uh, a week from now, when we go through the utilities funds and we have that ready to go. All in favor of passing bill 2022 25. Two five say nine. Aye. Any opposed? Five in favor, zero opposed. Next item is the first reading of the bill 2022 26. Bill 2022 26, an ordinance authorizing the city manager of the city of Cameron, Missouri to enter into, into a professional services agreement with HDR for preparing an engineering report for the wastewater treatment plant. Chair, we're going to entertain a motion. Chair, we're going to entertain a motion. Second. 
to uh, pass Bill 2022 Dash 23. So moved. Second. Discussion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we'll kind of do 26 and 27 together because uh, they're both basically the same thing. One is for wastewater, the next one is for water. Um, at our last meeting, uh, you approved a resolution authorizing us to apply for grant funding uh, up to $5 million in water and $5 million in wastewater uh, for improvements through uh, ARPA funds. As part of the requirement for the grant application, you have to submit a PER within 90 days of the application. So the PER is outlined here in these two uh, ordinances, again, would be fulfilling that, that grant application. Um, again, for the, the wastewater plant, what would we be looking at doing? We'd be looking at doing a, a peak, uh, peak flow holding basin uh, for rain events and also kind of some additional work on our headworks. The additional cost of that would be about $5 million. Um, and so that would, uh, so the not to proceed uh, cost on that PER was 43100 And again, this would be if we were uh, awarded the grant. Uh, on the water side, we'd be looking at, at uh, completing the build out of the business park as well as uh, adding an additional line north of 36, north of the water plant to loop back around to uh, Walnut Street to kind of help with some uh, distribution issues we have there on the water side. And the estimated cost of that project was about 1.9, or just under 2 million, $1.98 million. Um, again, these are requirements for the grant that we submitted back on the 14th. Um, I'm not real optimistic that we'll be getting these grants. Uh, the majority of the criteria uh, based on population, which we don't meet, uh, unemployment rate, which we don't meet, uh, mean household income, which we don't meet, um, uh, rates, which we don't meet. So there's a lot of things in there that we don't, we don't meet uh, being a disadvantaged community. You know, we're not under any abatement order or consent order. So, um, we, we didn't score real high on the grant, but again, there really wasn't things we could really control. But again, we, we submitted the application and we'll see what happens. So again, it would be staff's recommendation to approve these two, two agreements to allow us to complete these PERs. So let me understand this correctly. We're spending this amount of money in hopes to get a grant and then of course, Yeah, and, and it, it's not, um, again, the, the, the build out in, in, on the water side, the build out to the industrial park and the extension of north of 36, those are things that we'll look at doing in the future. If we don't get the grant, then we've got the PER ready to go for when it comes time that we are able to, to do that. So it, it's not we're, not, we're not wasting money on a PER that's, that would be out of date. It, it'll be good to have. And, and same with the, same with the, the sewer. Um, that's why we took the approach to, to tackle more at the plant um, as opposed to do additional work in the field that you know might be outdated at a certain time. So we've designed the peak holding basin and what work we could be done. And that would also be beneficial if and when we ever take lift stations one and two directly to the plant, which is kind of our long-term goal. This fits with that. So there is still value to us to us to have the have these done. Passing Bill 2022-27 on the first reading please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, and sign. Five in favor, if you're opposed. Next item on the agenda is resolution 2022-31. 
Resolution 2022-31, a resolution for the City of Cameron, Missouri, to accept a proposal for a Chevrolet Silverado 1500 from Randy Kerno for the waste for the Water Sewer Distribution Department. Chair, we'll make a motion to pass resolution 2022-31. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion. This is the last time I'm talking tonight that I'm done. I'm sitting down. Um, in, our, in our budget for this year, we had planned on purchasing a new dump truck, uh, or not necessarily a new dump truck, but a, a new to us dump truck uh, for the water department. Uh, so we budgeted $150,000 for that. Uh, unfortunately, um, our current water superintendent's truck, 2005 Ford F-250, um, decided that it was done and was no longer able for service. So uh, we changed our focus and now we look to, to purchase a, a pickup. Uh, we've been working with uh, Randy Kerno and, and any other dealers on trying to get a, a pickup, one that's available to us uh, that meets our needs. And we finally got one uh, coming in at Randy Kerno for a cost of $49,715. So uh, the money was, but like we had, had planned on buying a dump truck, uh, our needs changed, so we had to uh, we had to change and we'll look to buy a pickup this year and, and we'll uh, we'll try to keep the old dump truck growing another year and we'll work on, on finding another way to get another one of those at some other time. So uh, tell me about the dump truck that we're not getting. How's that? I believe is it a 2000 tad help me out there it's a it's a 2000 um it, we're starting to have issues it's it's reaching its end, end, end of its life and so that's why we have planned on on replacing it um and like i said we we try to we try to keep on top of keep our rolling stock in, in decent condition and when we get to the point where we're spending more money on maintenance than what the vehicle's worth then it's time to send it off down the road and do something different um you know unfortunately that in today's market and uh, with current government prices and stuff, it's, it's cheaper for us to buy, almost cheaper for us to buy a new pickup than it is to buy a, a two or three year old pickup, you know, so um, so we, we, we kind of went that route, but uh, um, no, again, our, our current dump truck is okay, it's still working, we've got it fixed, it's just it's just reaching its, its end of life, and, and we try to be nice to Tad in case we really need one, we'll, we'll go borrow one of his. <laughs> I, I will say, having been around here, Yeah, I, I think so, and I, I'll, I'll even, I think almost maybe to a fault sometimes. Sometimes we spend a lot of time and effort keeping something going when, unfortunately, we're kind of in a disposable society right now. Go get another one. But like I said, we, again, staff does a really good job of, of keeping all that stuff going and, and, and trying to get as much as we can out of it. <coughs> so are you going to try to get a dump truck in the budget for this year? No. Okay. Yep, that, that, we're going to wait another year on that. The price is a decent price. Yeah, like I said, I think, I, again, I think, I think it's, a, it's a very decent price for that. And, and anymore, you know, the, we struggle with just getting one. And again, a couple years ago, we didn't know that would be an issue, but now it's like, can we even find a pickup to, to, to get? So, we, like I said, we work with them, and they've done a good job for us. Are there any other questions? All in favor of passing resolution 2022-31. Five and ten. Any opposed? Any time? Five and ten. Zero opposed. Next item on the agenda is resolution 2022-32. Resolution 2022-32, a resolution approving the 2022 goals and objectives and adopting a vision statement for the City of Cameron, Missouri. All here are passing resolution 2022-32. The chair will entertain a motion to pass resolution 2022-32. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mayor. Uh, as you know, we had uh, a great session at uh, Stony Creek in, uh, uh, in St. Joe. Uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, we got the results back on the report from Patty Gentra. You all have a copy of that in front of you. The resolution, though, that you have is slightly different. And what happened was uh, 
we took the key performance area that the, uh, that the council objectives were, which were economic development, community investment, the second was infrastructure, and the third was community, uh, communication, community engagement, and participation. When we got her report back, and we looked at all of the, uh, the, the dots on our dot matrix, uh, we looked at the last item, and uh, we had put several of the items that she had uh, in the resolution. But if you look at the last item, uh, under communication, community engagement partnership, the first one was establish a communication officer position. Given our current budget situation, I, I understand that that is something that the council would like to do. But my recommendation is instead of trying to establish that communication officer position, I put back in a resolution slightly different wording, and that is examine acquiring communication officer services. That gives the staff a lot more uh, latitude to find those communication services rather than to try and find a room in the budget to hire a communications officer. And the second thing that uh, I did on that was the last item in, uh, in the report said to collaborate with the Historic Preservation Society, Chamber of Commerce, School District, and County. And so rather than naming those things specifically and then perhaps meeting out some people, we changed that to collaborate with other political subdivisions, service organizations, and private clubs. That gives us a latitude to work with many people other than just those specific ones that are named. Other than that, our uh, recommended resolution is the same as uh, Patty Nutrup uh, put in and including the vision that the uh, city council had agreed upon, which was Cameron is a thriving hometown destination community with opportunities for all to be rich. And that would be the uh, resolution we put forward uh, for you and the staff recommended approval. Thank you. All in favor of passing resolution 2022 dash 32. Precinct 5, let's say aye. Aye. All opposed, say sign. Aye. All in favor, zero or one vote. Resolution 2022 dash 33. something that uh, the parks want to kind of set a precedence of safety on our playgrounds. Uh, it's kind of a seven point uh, item guideline is what we're going to call it, I guess. Uh, all city owned playgrounds will be subject to the playground safety guide program guidelines. Uh, <clears throat> All equipment will be install, installed according to manufacturer specifications. Uh, the City of Cameron shall provide reasonable resources to ensure prudent and timely inspections and repairs. Uh, and that's one thing that I know our old piece that we had to removed we kind of got to a point where things were wearing out and, and breaking. We didn't really have funds available to, to replace as needed. Uh, <clears throat> All playground equipment shall be inspected, repaired, and maintained by City of Cameron employees with the necessary written documents. I believe in your packet is kind of our, what we currently use for inspections on a weekly basis. Uh, all playground equipment purchases, installers, inspections, and maintenance employees will perform repairs that do, do re perform repairs shall be trained uh, we go through 
every three years I take a playground safety inspector course and I pass on the all information onto the staff. Uh, and in order to maintain playground equipment in substantial compliance with current standard of care, uh, all playground or all equipment shall be purchased, certified in writing to the uh, International Playground Equipment Manufacturers Association, IPEMA, certified playground equipment program. So anything we purchase in the future will have the IPEMA stamp of approval, make sure it's all safe and, and uh, up to specifications. All new play areas shall meet the minimum Department of Justice 2010 ADA standard for accessible gut or accessible design. Basically that's anything we put in new will be ADA compliant. Anything that we change will have to be brought up to that code uh, for accessibility. Our park board is in agreement that that's something we want to kind of hang our hat on going forward is, is make, making sure that our playgrounds are clean and safe and usable for anybody, whether they're wheelchair bound or anybody. Uh, play is hugely important for the development of children, so uh, that's, that's kind of a priority of the park board. So. Any other questions or any questions? Can what, you, what started this? What started this was basically my own, I don't want to fall into another situation where we were a few years ago when we had to remove playgrounds uh, because there's not funding available to, to replace them. So as long as we stay current on our inspections and keep up on any maintenance as we go, we won't fall into that, that point where we have to rip complete pieces out or complete playgrounds out. So that, that's the idea behind it is, is we already have budget available to do so, but we're just going to make sure that we have those funds available to take care of as needed repairs and replacements. and we're going to, we're only going to uh, put in playgrounds that are IPEMA certified, which so basically we're not just going to go out and buy some off-market brand that doesn't have, meet all the, the standard care current standards. So uh, basically we're going to only put in the same <coughs> user-friendly pieces from now on. Have we ever done that before? No, we have. A lot of these things aren't, it's nothing yeah. really new, it's just basically making a statement saying these are the things that we can, will continue to do and, and even do a better job moving forward. Can I make it Thank you very much. All in favor of passing the resolution 2022-33. Please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Five favor, two opposed. Mayor, if I could introduce one thing on that. The, the staff has been receiving numerous phone calls, uh, emails, and questions uh, from uh, members of the public uh, on, on both sides of this issue. And so I asked Patrick if he would clarify for us what the city's legal position is on the administration. And then everyone, everyone here would have the same information and it will be part of the public record. Mayor, members of the council, as Steve said, I was asked to kind of give a little bit of guidance on public demonstrations and, specific, and specifically the First Amendment's protection of free speech. So I prepared this presentation. I am trying to distill down a month of 1L con law into 10 minutes. So we're gonna gloss over some things. We're really just gonna to touch on some of the high level stuff and the things that are currently in the city's code of ordinances that are applicable to some of these provisions. So as you see in front of you, the roadmap for tonight is to first kind of discuss what the First Amendment is, secondly discuss the public fora analysis and then regulations in the public fora. 
So the First Amendment is, everybody knows it, Congress shall make no law on virtue of freedom of speech. They're assuming much more in the First Amendment. We're talking strictly about freedom of speech tonight, so that is the most applicable provision. Uh, the Supreme Court, as you can tell, that says Congress, you want Congress. Supreme, the Supreme Court in um, Lavelle versus Griffin applied the First Amendment to the 14th Amendment to cities. Um, and now we're just gonna jump right into the, the meat of it. Uh, what is protected by the First Amendment? The first category that I want to discuss with you tonight is profanity. Profanity is protected by the First Amendment unless it is fighting words which are inherently likely to provoke a violent reaction. The city has already adopted this standard into section 8-36A1B of the code, um, specifically off this case. Uh, this main case up there is Cohen versus California. It's a 1971 case where a person wore a jacket that said uh, F the draft on it into a courthouse where women and children were present. He was arrested. He was tried under California's disturbing peace of Senate and profanity laws. He took that case to the Supreme Court, uh, the United States Supreme Court, and the United States Supreme Court determined that that draft and that expression of speech was protected by the First Amendment because it did not incite or declare or you know, provoke violence on anyone. A really easy way that I always use to give this example, and everybody on staff has heard this example. I can say, F U C protected. F U C I'm going to stab you is not protected. That's the dichotomy there. Uh, next, we're going to obscenity, and this one is going to take a little bit longer because there is some very significant Supreme Court cases deciding this, and there is a test that we have to apply. But first, obscenity is not protected in the First Amendment. Obscenity is not protected. Now, the key is. Is as you see in this Miller vs. California case, laws that are designed to regulate obscene materials must be carefully limited to words which depict or describe sexual conduct. That is what obscenity is. That is what the Miller court said, which is the case of uh, Mr. Miller, was a purveyor, purveyor of pornographic material. He sent out brochures to everyone in the state of California, uh, and some people saw that and reported him to the police. He was charged. He appealed all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court next slides back. Next slide is back. <laughs> when the Supreme Court adopted the Miller test, overturning what was called the Memoirs test, the Memoirs test previous to this was made it even more difficult to regulate obscene material. The memoirs test said that if it had any, absolutely any social interest or value, it was not obscene. So the, the, Supreme, the Supreme Court decided that in 1966 and then decided to not decide that in 1973 and adopted the Miller test. And the Miller test contains three factors, not elements, factors. So you have to weigh them all against each other. So the first factor is whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appeals to the purient interest, which is something, and again, I had to look up what the purient interest meant, and it's defined at the bottom. Whether the work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct specifically defined by the applicable law, i.e. the law that is attempting to regulate obscenity. And then finally, whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. And as I mentioned, the key to those first two, and the first one and the second one we'll talk about a little bit later, is the purient interest. What does that mean? The purient interest is that which appeals to a shameful or morbid interest in sex. It is not, in fact, go to the next one, keep talking about it. But so, the city has adopted the Miller test and the more stringent Miller test for minors into its code in 834. I think I accidentally chopped off the top part of the one for minors. But as you see there, the city has already adopted these into the code. Now at this point, the only way to really describe this is to discuss two of the cases that have dealt with it. Uh, the first being Miller, which that was material that specifically described, showed, and depicted 
sexual conduct between two people. The next case is one that came from 2011. I don't have it up here, but it was decided by the Supreme Court and specifically Justice Scalia in a, a pretty good opinion for about three paragraphs discusses how California did not have the right to prohibit violent video games from being sold to minors. And those violent video games, which I think appears by the opinion, Justice Alito played for multiple hours to figure out what exactly was going on in some of the prohibited games, included things like being able to murder another person. You know, and all, I'm sure everybody here has seen what some video games like Grand Theft Auto and stuff like that depict now. In that case, that material was deemed not to be obscene under the Miller test and under the Miller test for minors. Mainly because applying that standard and then looking at what we already do in a few minutes, it was seen to have additional value and not to appeal to that purity of interest. Specifically, Justice Scalia went into a pretty lengthy discussion about some of the uh, fairy tales that we read our kids before they go to bed. Specifically, the Brothers Grimm, uh, Hansel and Gretel, and how they got away. Um, he went in to discuss uh, Homer and Olympias uh, and all of those sorts of things to show that we do not consider those things because of their value to be obscene. Another good example that I always thought of is there is a difference between depictions of sexual intercourse and then what's in a science textbook, right? Those two things, while you could, you know, a science textbook does contain full pictures of anatomy that has scientific value. So it outweighs those other factors and it's not for the purity of interest in this tumor. And then exactly going to the next slide, which now this, uh, just this portion in common law for my class was two. This is an incredibly confusing area of law. Courts have always had a really hard time defining what these three forms are and what is them. So we have the traditional public fora, the limited designated public fora, and the non-public fora. Andrew, could you explain what a fora means? Fora means forum. It's just, I, the Supreme Court has had a little fancier than that. Um, but uh, the best description I can give you right now, the sidewalk is the traditional public fora, in here, right now, is the limited designated public fora. Back behind locked door where the staff works is the non-public fora. All of those public fora have different rules, different things that we can do. But tonight, we're going to mainly focus on that traditional public fora. And this is where I got really case heavy because these are, you guys are having me now talk about cases that every single law school student for the past 40 years has learned. These are some Supreme Court justices that did some pretty good writing. But so the traditional public fora um, in Hague versus CIO is a case where New Jersey actually permitted members of CIO, which it deemed to be a Marxist organization that was looking to overthrow capitalism from passing out brochures and you know walking on sidewalks and stuff like that. But it only prohibited them; it did not prohibit anybody else. Um, Justice Breyer, Justice Berger says. Wherever the title of streets and parks may rest, they have immorally been held in the trust for the use of the public and time out of mind have been used for the purposes of assembly, communicating thoughts between citizens and discussing public questions. That's one of those, I think we might have a bad. That's one of those sort of things that as an attorney you always hope you can write something that's actually that good. Um, then he goes on to say, such uses of streets and public places has from ancient times been a part of the privileges, immunities, rights, and liberties of citizens. So when we talk about parks, when we talk about streets, when we talk about sidewalks, they fall into that traditional public forum, that place where if you went back to ancient Greece, Socrates and Aristotle were debating each other on the sidewalks of Athens. And that's how it's always been. So we can go on to the next slide. But that does not mean that there's no ability to regulate, right? But first, I want to note that because they never say streets, because some of the cases are old enough, or they never say sidewalks, because some of the cases are old enough that they predate cars. So when the streets were more used for people just walking in them, so that, that is a change, and that's why I cited the Survivors Network of those abused by Chris Inc. v. Joyce. That is a Supreme Court case that overturned the <coughs> <coughs> interference 
with a um, church and during the service. Uh, specifically, it said, the court said, sidewalks are a traditional public forum which occupy a special position in terms of First Amendment protections and the government's ability to regulate speech in such places is very important. Next, I cited to McCulley versus Copley, which is a more recent case. McCullen versus Copley dealt with Massachusetts prohibiting uh, the protest within 35 feet of any entrance of, of any entrance of any hospital that performed abortions. The Supreme Court struck down that regulation, saying that even in a public forum, and gave this rule, even in a public forum, the government may impose reasonable restrictions on the time, place, or manner of protected speech. Provided that the restrictions are justified without reference to the content of the regulated speech, that they are narrowly tailored to serve a significant government interest, and that they leave open ample alternative channels of or communication of the information. The Supreme Court, in a, I believe it was a 7-2 decision, decided that uh, Massachusetts law went too far in that it only prohibited that certain type of protest, but it would allow somebody to stand at that same spot and hand out things for them which it did not determine as content-based, but determined that it was not narrowly tailored, which is key in those sorts of regulations. Because if you're going to serve your significant government interest in doing anything that prohibits the use of the public forum for the communication of ideas, you need to make sure that you are as narrowly tailored as possible so that you do not accidentally gobble up something else with it, right? And so then my final slide is the city has adopted Time, place, manner restrictions on the use of public places, specifically the traditional public forum for demonstrations, specifically section 8 36 peace disturbance and section 8 37 disorderly conduct. There are various provisions in those which I believe could be considered narrowly tailored. There are some that are a little bit more subjective than what I think a court would most likely uphold. Specifically, there's a provision in 8 36 that just says you're prohibited from making loud noises. What's, I don't know what loud noises to you, I don't know what loud noises to me, I don't know what loud noises to Zach. So that would be something that we would probably try and clean up and put a decibel limit in so you can have an objective standard instead of a subjective standard. But that is the end of my 10 minute, hopefully 10 minute, uh, three months of con law for you all to hopefully be able to have a good discussion on this topic. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy. So basically, I think uh, Mr. Rasmussen said something about where the city stands on this. What is the city able and what is the city not able to do? The city is able to enforce reasonable time, place, manner restrictions that are narrowly tailored to serve a significant government interest and leave open ample alternatives for the communication. English, please. <laughs> we're, able, we're able to do what the Supreme Court tells us we're able to do. I think, Patrick, what you're saying, you can enforce those reasonable time, but it could not enforce the content of what the language is. Yes, again, as a governmental entity, our first and foremost aim is to avoid content-based regulations. That, so I told you the standard, that one that you said wasn't English, but I think it's perfect English. Um, so that is, that is the standard when you do not regulate content. When you regulate content, you go up from that standard, which is a, it's called interme intermediate scrutiny, which by the terms of it, it's the intermediate one. So there's one above it called strict scrutiny, which is even more harsh on governmental entities. And I think the only case that actually I can remember from common law that passed that was Korematsu, which is an infamous Supreme Court case that upheld the United States government's internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, but I have yet to see over the, at least my career, the past seven years, any case past strict scrutiny. So we do not regulate content. Just period, we look for reasonable time, place, manner restrictions that are narrowly tailored to serve a, gov to serve a significant government interest and leave open ample alternatives for that communication. And I'd like to add to that my
if we wanted to say if you're going to protest, you can only do it from eight to eight. Is that something that we could do? So that would be one where if we had to look at it, and I have not researched any city that does the eight to eight. There are cities that do close parks um, to protest, specifically Kansas City does close Mill Creek Park, which is a common protest area. But with the issue of the enclosing the sidewalk, I could see some more significant issues there because that would you'd have to realistically institute a curfew for it to not be content-based or to be based on or to be based in relation to the speech, which is kind of that second standard to avoid content-based regulation. Because if you say eight to eight, you can't protest or you know, demonstrate, but then you can still walk on the street with your friend talking. You can walk down the street with five people going from a portables to somewhere else. Holding a sign. Holding a sign, and then all of a sudden we're back into getting close to regulating the content, regulating something based on reference to its content. Not content, but reference to its content, which is also invalid under that state. Now, we could, I guess, institute a curfew, which has been done before. Um, as a community, we watched what started in the name of protest to the Supreme Court ruling um, on Roe v. Wade, a small group of protesters that were making their voices heard, and I completely respect that. I respect their passion, whether or not I agree with their position. Um, wish that it could have been done in a more tasteful and effective manner, and, and hopefully somebody um, maybe one of the adults in charge of that group can convey what works to get legislature changed. Um, but what I don't agree with was when they became aware of a local church that was planning a procession, and I know it was referred to as a parade, but we weren't throwing candy. It was a procession. That was to begin at one spot, end at the church in celebration of their grand opening, and to kick off a great revival week. Not only were members of the church invited, every member of the community was invited, and it was for the victory of this community. To my understanding, when the group that was protesting the Roe v. Wade overturned, um, they complained, and someone within city leadership determined it is acceptable to violate our First Amendment rights citing various traffic laws that may be or may not be broken, supposed to need for permits. We watched this group gather night after night, turning what was supposed to be a protest into a nightly street party, complete with karaoke machines, song lyrics that contain profanity and violence that I wouldn't even repeat in front of that young lady or that one, that one too young and that one's my older. I would not do that. This was public on the streets. We had underage young ladies in short shorts out there twerking on the streets. And it ended with trespassing and written threats to the church to take it as a warning. 
Only after some of that was done was there, um, as far as I know, any city involvement possibly. And I'm not aware that there was. But it's my understanding that we were prohibited from our procession due to concern for traffic safety. Yet this group was allowed to stand over the highway holding signs, distracting the drivers on the highway below in an antagonistic manner. It's not where they started their protest, not where they ended it, they just felt to do it that day. It was kind of a victory dance that the others First Amendment, Amendment rights had been violated. And I don't know who or why that decision was made, but I think it, it needs to be discussed. This was a pre-planned right of religious expression and celebration. And even if we hadn't pre-planned it, and we were responding to their protest, in response to the protesters' bill of rights, we had no right to stop us or ask for permits at all. We have a full right to counter protest with the same permit exemptions as any other group. This was not an us versus them. This was not an opposition to their protest. This was religious expression and protected under the free exercise clause. That clause states that American citizens have the right to accept any religious belief and engage in religious rituals. It also states that that clause protects not just re religious beliefs, but actions made on behalf, of the, on behalf of those beliefs. Well, we believe it's our job to bring people into the church. The free exercise clause not only protects religious belief and expression, but it also seems to allow for the violation of some laws as long as that violation is made for religious reasons. Every member of this community was invited, as I stated before. Our belief was fellowship. We believe it's needed in this community. And the procession was merely part of the ritual to kick off that celebration. And I would just like the council to stop and think, if we're going to make rules for thee, it has to be across the board. This would have been your most peaceful, reasonable demonstration that, they, that could have been out there. The public joins in, they put flags up. You see us out there honking back when we do hold these processions. And I just find it a bit disturbing that under the circumstances that the same rights were not afforded to us under our First Amendment as the group that was out there twerking in the streets. Thank you for your time. West 3rd, uh, Cameron, Missouri, uh, 29 year resident. Um, myself and my co organizer of the Cameron Freedom Festival uh, came here this evening and it was just my intent to listen. But I was very inspired by the lady who just spoke and the gentleman who spoke in the first public participation, and I'd, I'd like to thank them both. Um, I, I have very little to add, but I thank you for your time and listening. Um, it is not my intent to uh, uh, to um, snag up or, or hinder anybody else's rights to their First Amendment free speech either. My husband fought in Vietnam for everybody's right to hold up whatever sign they want, but I think there's a proper time and place for things. I'd like to address, as, as the, that kind lady that just left the podium addressed, that the same rights were not afforded um, to a church that wanted to have a, a celebration um, as were to the protesters, that um, we as event organizers uh, faced the same situation at the Freedom Festival during the parade. Um, first off, we just learned about the, that the protest was going to come a few days before our event. Um, when there's gonna be 3,000 people present in public, and uh, many of them, at least 75% of them, are children under 12, it's, um, it's very heartbreaking to see uh, minors being encouraged um, to target floats that go past that have small children as the Boy Scouts the Dance Academy, um, and be screening things like, don't you care that your children aren't going to have a choice with what they do with their bodies as they hold protest signs with coat hangers on them? There's appropriate times and places for everything. If our city does not have a required permit for protesters, then why do I as an event planner have to purchase one? Why does our non-for-profit have to pay for one? I highly encourage the city council to consider that permits should be required for protesters and that their times and that their places be, be limited. I attempted to stand on the sidewalk by, by Earl Park to watch the parade, and the protesters moved to the street in front of me so that I could not see. 
and a police officer was standing right there beside them. And when I asked them if they could move, I asked the police officer if they could be moved. He denied my request. And they were allowed to stand in the street during the parade after we specifically requested that they not be in the street. A non-for-profit that is doing things on behest of the city with a very insurance, a very expensive insurance policy that we have to pick up. And we take that liability upon ourselves. And if we feel like we're out on a limb and not receiving any support from law enforcement or from the, the city council or from the citizens, it's gonna make it very difficult for us to continue to plan these events in the future if we feel like they're not gonna be safe. So if a permit is not required, then my question to you is why the heck not? Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, the cardinal was great, and the partial son was great, it was fun to be in, and I look forward to the fall event. Yeah, that's a lot of guys. Thank you very much. Um, I know it's probably been an emotional one. Oh, all right. I missed you. Go ahead. It's been an emotional one in the community. Uh, please help cooler heads prevail. Uh, it is kidney stone season. Stay hydrated. Don't stay outside too long. And uh, see you next week. Thank you.